Hi folks, my name is Phil Yore. I'm a third year at the University of Chicago, and I'm here today to talk to you about evolutionary ethics and the moral skeptic. Before I begin, I'd just like to thank the Jackson Family Center for Ethics and Values and David Kaloran for organizing this conference. I'm very excited to see how the innovative online format works out. So now to begin, in this paper, I address the engagement between Robert Richards' revised version of evolutionary ethics, hereafter I'll call it RV for short, um, in his paper, A Defense of Evolutionary Ethics, and Richard Joyce's objections to Robert Richards' view in The Evolutionary Vindication of Morality. I first assess Joyce's introduction of the moral skeptic, a hypothetical individual who rejects commonly held moral judgments or beliefs, and contend that Joyce's in introduction of the skeptic at this stage of justifying RV's overarching moral axiom, uh, the criterion of morality, as Richards calls it, is ineffectual. I then argue that the moral skeptic can be introduced at a later stage in Richard's argument where he uh, attempts to explain the imperative force of ought when used in moral contexts. In particular, I argue that the moral skeptic can present a serious problem at this stage of Richard's argument if we treat the skeptical position as a position on par with Richard's RV view um, and ask whether a third party observer uh, could ad adequately distinguish between the two views. Um, I conclude by assessing a series of possible responses available to the proponent of RV and attempting to establish the distinction between the skeptical position and her own. So the core of this paper then uh, is, a, is a methodological one. The, the primary questions we're concerned with are how do we effectively use the moral skeptic, this individual who denies uh, commonly held uh, moral judgments or, or beliefs, um, and what sorts of avenues are plausible to respond to the skeptic. Um, so how do we use the skeptic and how do we respond to the moral skeptic? Um, this means that uh, an important related issue will not be emphasized uh, in the paper itself. That was something I'd be very interested in, in seeing how it plays out in the discussion board. Um, and, uh, that is, uh, Richards is concerned in part with the is-ought problem, so attempting to derive an ought from an is, and showing that our typical justificatory procedure for axiomatic ought propositions so, and I'll get a, into to what that amounts to a bit more in a minute, but these axiomatic ought propositions, um, the way that we justify them is an appeal to facts. In particular, we appeal to common sense judgments that accord with the axiom under consideration. Um, so Richard's criterion of morality. Um, though the discussion of this problem and Richard's overall approach um, is, is welcome to the discussion to follow, as I've emphasized, the primary concern of this paper is not the overall plausibility of Richard's approach to the Izzot problem, but rather with the introduction and the use of the moral skeptic in this context. So that is in the consideration of RV, um, and in particular the criterion of morality or its core axiom of, of that ethical system. So uh, just to sketch out the, the primary relevant points about RV to contextualize what we'll be focusing on, um, the primary aim is to show there's no inherent logical or conceptual error made in linking a theory of ethics to biological or naturalistic facts, more generally. Um, that is the naturalistic fallacy, um, this, this claim that, that it's um, an inherent logical fallacy to attempt to derive an ought from an is, is not necessarily committed by an evolutionary ethics or any sort of naturalistic ethical program, more generally. Um, two stages in Richard's theory are important for our purposes. First, the distinction between what he calls the criterion of morality, his core axiom of his system, um, which he defines as that to act morally is to intend to act for the good of the community and particular moral imperatives that obtain in given community. So say in some communities, um, uh, one ought to uh, you know, help an individual who's drowning in a lake, or uh, to use one of Richard's favorite examples, uh, one ought to sacrifice a, a virgin in order to help the crops grow, in order to help sustain the community. Um, so the, formal is univer the former is universal, that is the criterion of, of morality that to act uh, morally is to intend to act for the good of the community, uh, it obtains across all communities, all, at least all human communities across all time. Um, while the latter, these particular moral imperatives are going to vary over communities and time, they're going to be relative to the, the beliefs and, and cultural contexts of different communities. Um, the criterion of morality, as I've said, is taken as an axiom of Richard's ethical system, and as we will see, it is an ought proposition justified by appeal to a set of facts. Um, so that's the first stage, is this distinction between the criterion of morality and these ethical, or in these particular moral imperatives, the former being universal, the latter uh, varying as a function of time and community. Um, um, and then the Richard's move to justify the criterion of morality, which we'll get more into in a moment, um, by appealing to, to facts in some way. Um, uh, so then the second stage is, is um, we, we note that we need a, a more fine-grained sense of ought. That is intuitively the relative sense of ought for an ethical theory 
um, is imperative or exhortatory as opposed to, for example, predictive. In order to establish the imperative force of ought, Richards appeals to the difference in structured contexts in the cases of moral and non-moral uses of ought. We, we'll get into a bit more detail below, but the rough idea is that the context of um, a moral use of ought supplies rules or laws that prescribe the action that ought to be taken as promoting the community good. And thus, once we have assumed Richard's criterion of morality, these are taken as moral acts. So in the second stage, we're trying to tease out the imperative force of ought when it's used in moral contexts, as opposed to the predictive force of ought when it's used in non-moral contexts. An example of the former being something like one ought to help an individual drowning in a lake, the latter being something like a ball ought to roll down a ramp. Um, so we'll be concerned then with the introduction of the moral skeptic at each uh, of these stages. First, at the stage where we attempt to link the ought propositions, in particular the criterion of morality, to factual claims. And then second, where we attempt to establish the imperative force of the moral use of ought. So now just to sketch out briefly Richard's argument uh, for the first stage, so in particular this linking of the criterion of morality to, um, to facts and justifying the assumption of this particular criterion of morality acting for the good of, intending to act for the, the good of the community, um, justifying the assumption of that criterion by appealing to facts. Um, um, uh, first we should note that Richards is assuming and restricting his domain of consideration to axiomatic systems. Um, um, uh, and so for these systems, there is some principle that cannot be justified by appealing to anything in the system. There's something that stands at the foundation um, from which everything else in the ethical system is, is uh, built up from. Um, so how do we justify these sort of, of basic foundational principles? Uh, Richards holds that we appeal to common sense judgments which reflect the principle. So for example, how do we justify modus ponens to use one of Richards' examples? It's a little different, it's an inference rule, but Richards holds the same view for axioms and inference rules of a system. Um, uh, we, we look at instances of what we intuitively take to be good reasoning for modus ponens and abstract the principle if A, then B, and A, therefore B, from these instances. So in the case of the criterion of morality analogously, we take, the, uh, a, we take a set of commonly shared moral judgments and find that the criterion of morality is reflected in all these judgments which we take to be good moral judgments intuitively. Um, we thus abstract out the criterion of morality as an axiom of our ethical system. In essence, Richard's idea is that we ultimately justify the axioms of a system by showing that they accord with facts about the world, specifically commonly held judgments um, within a particular community, well, within a particular community, but varying across different communities evaluating their own set of, of judgments. Um, so there's an immediate problem. Somebody might think, well, isn't this approach viciously circular? Uh, we want to construct an ethical system which will provide uh, uh, us with, with directives for actions, um, by means of imperatives or something like imperatives. Uh, but if we're relying on concrete imperatives elicited from commonly held moral judgments, and if these judgments are ultimately supposed to be derived from the axioms they are meant to justify, it seems that we are chasing our tails. So if I'm going to point to, to moral judgments in order to, to justify a view, um, um, uh, but then, or I'm sorry, to justify the axiom, but, but then I want to use the axiom as the foundation for the system that I'm going to construct, of which these moral judgments are presumably going to function as imperatives, uh, it seems like we're being circular. However, this concern overemphasizes the role of the system itself in Richard's view, I think. The point is not that we need an ethical system in order to proceed with ethical action. Rather, our starting point is one where we have a series of commonly held moral judgments, and we take that as our starting point, uh, which we wish to then systematize. In virtue of this systematization, which produces axioms like the criterion of morality, uh, acting for the community good, uh, we are better able to determine what we take to be the ethical course of action in a given scenario. But there's an important sense in which axioms like the criterion of morality are simply an abstract generalization of our pre-existing moral intuitions. The line thus seems to be bur uh, blurred on Richard's view um, between what he calls descriptive ethics and imperative ethics. Um, and this is a theme that will emerge later on. Um, so with this sketch of Richard's argument in mind, we can introduce Joyce's moral skeptic into the picture. It seems that the appeal to common sense moral judgments is vulnerable to one who does not share such judgments, namely the moral skeptic. The moral skeptic, as described above, rejects the common sense facts that Richard's theory assumes, in particular these moral judgments that Richard is appealing to as facts, so as judgments that we actually make. Um, um, the, the skeptic is rejecting these. Um, to be clear, the skeptic that we are imagining is not one who necessarily rejects evolutionary theory outright, um, but rather the common sense moral judgments from which Richard's axiom, the criterion of morality, is constructed. 
Joyce takes the moral skeptic to pose a serious problem for RV, and presumably Richard's model for justification of any ethical theory, because if common sense moral judgments are the ultimate justification for the axioms and inference rules of an ethical system, and thereby the system as a whole, and the skeptic denies these judgments, then it seems that the proponent of RV, or any ethical theory, is left with no tools uh, with which to persuade the skeptic. But this, as Joyce contends, quote, undermines the whole enterprise, for the challenge of deriving ought from is, as it is classically conceived, is to convince a sensible moral skeptic uh, uh, that her uh, sensible uh, acceptance of various relevant empirical data logically commit her to certain moral conclusions. The trick is to get people who haven't already agreed to a moral view to agree. It is this contention, or end quote, it is this contention that undermined Joyce's position, as we will see, the idea that we have to, to get the moral skeptic to come around to our view. In essence, Joyce's moral skeptic systematically rejects any judgment that accords with, and thereby serves to justify, Richard's criterion of morality, or whatever other axiom or rule is under consideration. This does seem to constitute a serious problem for RV. In attempting to persuade some individual to adopt some ethical framework, Richards contends that our ultimate appeal is to common sense moral judgments that reflect the axioms or rules of the framework. So if an individual systematically rejects these judgments, they seem to be beyond the reach of Richards' justificatory model. All this seems right, but Joyce must, and does, hold that this is a serious defect in Richards' justificatory model, that the trick is to get those who haven't already agreed to a moral view to accept it. It's not obvious that Richards needs to accept this standard uh, for his view to be considered satisfactory. In fact, at least one classical conception of moral theory doesn't seem to concern itself with the skeptic at all. Aristotle holds in the Nicomachean Ethics that ethical knowledge brings no benefit to the person who lacks a sufficiently well-formed character, either in virtue of immaturity or depravity. That is, only those with sufficient, a sufficiently well-formed character are eligible to participate in philosophical discourse about morality on the Aristotelian view. But the moral skeptic, who denies the most straightforward of moral judgments systematically, surely cannot be uh, a sufficiently uh, surely cannot be one with a sufficiently well-formed moral character. If she were, she'd share these basic intuitions. Thus, a similar move seems available for the proponent of RV in response to the skeptic, one who rejects the common sense moral judgment that justify the criterion of morality and thereby rejects the criterion itself as being unjustified, is simply beyond the pale of moral discourse. RV can reject the assumption that uh, it must persuade the moral skeptic in order to serve as a proper moral theory. A uh, legitimate response to the skeptic here is just to shrug one's shoulders and say, there's nothing more I can do with you until you come around to these basic intuitions. And then as a brief note, it seems that an evolutionary ethical view is an even stronger position than the classical Aristotelian one here. While not necessarily a fatal problem for the Aristotelian view, one can be uncomfortable with Aristotle's response to those of malformed character because according to the onerous standards laid out in the ethics, it seems like few people actually satisfy the, the character and habit qualities required for participation in moral discourse on Aristotle's view. RV, on the other hand, seems to avoid this problem because one would expect the relevant intuitions to be widely held because uh, of the evolutionary advantage they supply. That is, we give a, an explanation roughly of the form, communities that hold moral judgments that intend to serve the community good will be selected for over communities that lack these judgments. So we would expect that most individuals then um, in these communities that have been selected for will hold these judgments and therefore um, 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 few people would be, would be eliminated uh, or be placed beyond the pale of moral discourse um, on this theory. So it seems to be a slight advantage for the, the RV view or uh, an evolutionary ethical view over the, the classical Aristotelian position if they take the same sort of response to the moral skeptic. So that's my response to stage one. Uh, that is uh, Richard's introduction of the moral skeptic to attempt to undermine, uh, I'm sorry, Joyce's introduction of the moral skeptic to undermine Richard's justification of uh, his criterion of morality, that to act morally is to intend to act for the community good. So now moving on to stage two, which you recall, uh, may recall is the, the idea that um, uh, we need to tease out this imperative sense of ought um, um, uh, in order to have a, a full ethical theory. Um, so it seems that the moral skeptic is an ineffectual objection to Richard's justificatory model for his criterion of morality for the skeptic can simply be put beyond the pale of discourse in the subject. However, I will now argue that we can reintroduce the skeptic at a later stage in Richard's argument and that with careful formulation, we can use the skeptic here to present a serious problem for Richard's view. This stage of the argument begins by acknowledging the intuition that there's a distinct usage between instrumental um, and, and uh, or instrumental as predictive 
uh, ought and moral ought, where the latter tends to imply some sense of obligation or imperative or exhortation. Um, Richard's attempts to make room for such a distinction in this discussion of Gerwith's uh, notion of structured contexts. Uh, Gerwith states, um, or Gerwith, sorry, um, states, quote, a context is structured when it is constituted by laws or rules which determine certain existential or practical necessities. He argues that one way of deriving ought from is uh, appeals to these structured contexts. For example, we say that the ball ought to roll down the ramp because of certain physical laws, such as the law of gravitation and physical conditions, the incline of the ramp and the height of the ball relative to the surface, uh, which constitute the structured context. That is, we appeal to these laws and conditions when we assert that the release of the ball should be followed by its rolling down the ramp. Likewise, in the case of human action, we appeal to the relevant lo uh, laws or rules which apply to that structured context. In particular, Richard asserts, we appeal to evolutionary facts about the way a given human agent has been conditioned to behave, as well as perhaps social facts which bear an intimate relation to community selective pressures. And uh, as Richard says, the constructive forces of evolution impose a practical necessity on each man to promote the community good by performing or not performing the act in question. Uh, and because we are uh, taking acting for the community good as the meaning of moral, that is Richard's criterion of morality, we say that the agent uh, in question ought to perform the action. The moral skeptic comes into play here by denying the intuitive distinction between the predictive use of ought exemplified in the uh, case of the ball and the ramp so that we say the ball ought to roll down the ramp in virtue of such and such physical conditions, and the imperative use of ought in the case of human action, for example, Johnny ought to help the old lady cross uh, uh, with her groceries. Um, the challenge for RV is to justify this difference uh, in, in force of the assertions, that is the imperative force and the predictive force, um, uh, in order to distinguish her position from the skeptical one. Also, we can frame the problem in such a way that the maneuver undertaken above, putting the skeptic beyond the pale of discourse, is unavailable. That is, rather than taking the challenge as to persuade the skeptic of a difference between the use of ought in moral and non-moral contexts, uh, we, frame it, we can frame it as a challenge for the proponent of RV to distinguish her position from the uh, skeptics for a third-party observer who shares the intuitive distinction between the force of moral and non-moral ought uh, with the proponent of RV. If the proponent of RV is unable to justify the asserted distinction between moral and non-moral oughts within the framework available to her, specifically by appealing to differences in structured context, um, is, um, to a, to a third-party observer, distinguished to a third-party observer, so that RV is, indis is uh, indistinguishable from the moral skeptic's position in any substantial way here, uh, then it seems that RV is an unsatisfactory moral theory as any satisfactory moral theory will adequately distinguish itself from the skeptical position which we, by default, reject. Here are three possible lines the proponent of RV might take to justify uh, the distinction between moral and non-moral uh, ought, and I'll try to evaluate each very briefly. So the first I call mitigating factors. One might be inclined to claim that uh, the case of human action has certain mitigating factors that give rise to the imperative force of ought in the context. That is, in the example above, Johnny could do otherwise than help the old lady cross the street, but a ball could not do anything but roll down the ramp once it is released. Depending on how narrow we set the, uh, the set of counterfactuals we are permitted to consider is, this, either, this move either commits us to causal indeterminacy in the case of human action, or allows non-moral structured contexts to also have mitigating factors. The former disjunct requires that we hold all causal elements of structured contexts the same, but claim that the agent could have done otherwise wishes to say that the causal elements of a scenario do not determine the result, a consequence unacceptable in the naturalistic framework of RV. Or we say that the causal elements themselves could have been different. But this is also the case for non-moral uses of ought as well. For example, the ball ought to have rolled down the ramp, but the coefficient of friction was too high. So mitigating factors cannot distinguish between predictive and imperative uses of ought. So that's the first line, which I want to reject, the mitigating factors line. So the second line I, call, I, I just label as phenomenology. One might claim the difference is uh, between moral and non-moral uses of ought and the imperative and predictive forces that we're supposed to take corresponding to each um, is in the way that we experience the utterance or thought of ought in the case of moral and non-moral contexts. That is, we experience ought in the moral context in a certain intense way, say, an escapable practical necessity, which we pick out with the term imperative. While in the non-moral case, our experience of ought is less intense, we might say, and it's mere expectation, uh, which we pick out with the term predictive. But the phenomenological distinction doesn't seem so clear. 
Ordinary uses, uh, use of the term ought in mere predictive context can have a certain intensity similar to the one in the uh, moral case. For example, one might express consternation at a snowy April day by exclaiming, it ought to be 70 degrees out, it's April. Well, maybe not in Chicago, but nevertheless. Or conversely, one may uh, use a moral ought with less intensity, such as when one remarks, that guy ought to hold the door open for those coming in behind him. So it doesn't seem that the phenomenological distinction of intensity maps cleanly onto the moral-non-moral -moral ought distinction. Moreover, even if we could improve uh, the mapping, it doesn't seem that a phenomenological examination can offer the justification that the proponent of RV needs. RV needs to justify the intuitive distinction between moral and non-moral ought, but appeal to the phenomenology of ought seems just to reiterate this intuition, which is precisely what the skeptic rejects. So it doesn't constitute, uh, it's simply pointing to the distinction rather than offering an explanation of how um, RV is able to account for the distinction. So then the final option I call causal role of the ought propositions. Finally, one might point out that in moral contexts, utterances or token thoughts of the ought proposition exert a causal influence on the agent, while in contrast, the ought proposition exerts no such causal influence in non-moral cases. I can yell myself blue in the face, but it's not going to make a saw cut pine wood, for example. Perhaps the imperative force of ought uh, really picks out this, uh, this causal role of token instances of the proposition in moral contexts. While I think that this is the strongest case to be made for the distinction between moral and non-moral ought, one might be inclined to think that it, is sim that it simply pushes the problem back a step. We still need to explain why moral ought propositions are able to exert this causal influence on the agent as opposed to non-moral uses of ought not exerting a causal influence on, say, you know, a, a saw or a ball on a ramp. Um, in light of these considerations, one might begin to doubt that RV can in fact account for the difference in the force of moral ought and non-moral ought. Such doubt leads us to a final disjunction. Either RV is unsatisfactory as a moral theory, or the problem posed by the introduction of the moral skeptic makes an unwarranted assumption, namely that there is a distinction between moral and non-moral ought. While I have not here the space to adjudicate uh, such a distinction, I will note that it bears a formal similarity to Joyce's skeptical problem above, where Joyce assumes that the, moral, the goal of moral theory or ethical theory um, is to, to persuade the, the moral skeptic to come about to uh, one's ethical or moral system. So that we may be inclined to make a parallel move and reject the presupposition of the distinction between moral and non-moral ought. However, though such a move uh, is logically open to the proponent of RV here, that is to say that, well, there's really no distinction between when I want to use moral ought except that I'm applying it to a human agent, um, as opposed to when I use ought in the case of the ball ought to roll down the ramp. Um, however, though such a move is logically open to the proponent of RV here, we may question the wisdom of executing it. In rejecting Joyce's supposition, uh, we were able to show that the implicit historical grounding, what he called the classical conception of his claim, was not in fact so clear deflating that horn of the dilemma. Here, we seem hard-pressed to deflate our intuitions in a similar way so that uh, the move would do damage to genuine beliefs we have about moral ought. The question thus becomes, to what extent ought we sacrifice our pre-theoretical intuitions in order to maintain our moral theory? Um, it seems that the fate of RV and perhaps naturalistic ethics generally hangs in the balance here. Thank you very much.